don't know. If you don't know what medicine you have to take when your head hurts or when you have some disease, you ask a doctor. If you don't know this hadith, then you ask a scholar. I mean, it makes sense, right? Logically, you're not going to go and ask a Christian or someone else about a hadith. Or you're going to take that from them. No. You need to understand. You're not going to ask an atheist about the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. You need to understand who to go to. And this is, again, just not me speaking. This is, you know, bare reason and rationale. Another thing that they like to do, as we said, they give you the citation, the quotation, the reference, but it's not actually there. It doesn't exist there. It's not in the books. So you need to make sure, that, is this actually in this book, in this page, in this volume, or not? You need to check. Verification. Moving on. Extensive use of narrations from history books, like those of At-Tabari, Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Sa'ad, etc. A lot of these people don't understand. Of course, no... Don't misunderstand. These are great scholars of Islam. But you see, when these people wrote these books, they wrote it that contained certain raw material about early Muslims. There's many narrations that might not be authentic. They wrote it a lot of times for scholars, not for the general public. Which leads me into something very important here to just take a tangent. When the printing press was invented, Muslim scholars were very reluctant. Why? This is not something negative. A lot of times, some Muslims try to portray this as something negative. They were reluctant because they understood that once this is in place, how easy it will be for knowledge to reach people without effort. Without effort. Before, they were used to traveling for months. Bukhari. The ulama of the Muslim Ummah, the effort that they put into gathering the narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu and here you are now just picking up a book or on the internet, just searching, so easy. What comes with that effort is the responsibility, the spirituality, the experience that gave these people the edge that they had for being called Muslim scholars. These people collected these books. Now, can anyone, who can they access the internet or get a book, claim themselves to be scholars? No. And that is why they knew also that some of the information that will be published is not actually befitting just the general masses. But that, that when this door will open, the floodgates will open. And then now people start accessing books and this and that. So people could access these books. And that they didn't have the tools, though, to be able to use these books. You can't just pick a book and just read it. Just any person can pick some book of hadith and fiqh and just say, okay, I'm just going to read it. This you have to understand. It never happened before. Every time it came, the book would come with a scholar. The people who wrote those books by the hands, you know, from the mouth of the scholars and the ulama. It was always, this was the, the protection the isnad, the chain of narrations, which is part of our deen. Now, you just take, read, whatever anyone can read, take, cut and paste. It's a cut and paste job. That's exactly what happens. So that is why, again, in these books, these people love it, to just look, see what happens, what fits their argument, what suits their argument, and just put it up for people there. And they say, ah, it's in At-Tabari. It's Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham. Ibn Sa'ad, there you go, it's your books. So then your Ahmed, Muhammad, and Fatima, your lame people saying, ah, oh, oh, I heard about these people. Okay, therefore, they're, everything is credible. No. See, if you read these books and the introduction, you find the disclaimers in them. And this is something very important. That you look and you understand, is this true or not? Irregardless of where it is, is this true or not? Next, disregarding the fact that not all the narrations that may have connected change of trustworthy narrators serve as evidence. One needs to take into account what other narrators relate about the same issue and compare different narrations before making an inference or deduction. So, a narration might be cut short. You need to look at other narrators. 
one of the principles of hadith is that a person who has thiqa or is reliable, if another person comes to narrate a hadith on the same subject and may be different, but has more reliability than them, then this is more authentic. This is the correct. So see, not everyone would know that. When a missionary comes to you and puts in front of you a hadith that is hand-picked to confuse you, you look at it, oh my God, I can't believe that. But you see, you don't have the principles. You see how dangerous it is. And that is why, again, you need to go back to the principles. You need to go back. This is why this is needed, brothers and sisters. This is why courses like this are needed. This is why ulama are needed. So that they can protect people from falling in disastrous problem. Next, indifference to the delicacies or the subtleties of the Arabic language. A single word or phrase may have quite different meanings in different contexts. And this is something that is of significant importance. And we're going to talk about this, inshallah, after the break. Please stay tuned. Thursdays provide. In Britain, we are facing one big problem, that are you Muslim or British? The space to talk. In India, back home, they ask, are you a Muslim first or Indian first? And we Muslims should know how to reply, how to turn the tables over. The place to knock. Why Trinity cannot be regarded in that sense, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? The opportunity to ask. But even if we agree that what the Christians say, that he was crucified, so if Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, died for three days, who controlled the world? That means even God died? The freedom to unmask. So there are various ways which we can prove the argument yeah, to be wrong. Yeah. Let's meet Dr. Zakir every Thursday at 6.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 9.30 a.m. India on Peace TV. Peace TV presents over 100 million viewers at one of the largest peace conferences in the world addressing a sea of spellbound spectators over 30 world-renowned orators on Islam with credentials impeccable the truth of Islam Deen is your way of life it is our duty our obligation by following the Quran and Sunnah we will give the message to one and all one and all with articulation exquisite read the book of Allah Islam is the easy way it's the simple way remind each other the Muslim is not a source of harm for other people collaborate with the people for good this is the call of Islam with the mission of spreading the truth of Islam. Do what you can to spread the word of Islam. Wherever we are, live like Muslims. Use your power. Allah is saying, why do you need anything else? This Quran is self-sufficient. The only book on the face of the globe, the Quran. How a human being should lead his life is given in this instruction manual, manual the, glorious Quran. the glorious Quran. For peace to prevail on earth in peacemakers, Next on Peace TV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brothers and sisters, this is Gabriel Romani, your host, and you are watching Peace TV. And we're taking a course, Defense Against Disaster. And we've reached now indifference that people have to the subtleties of the Arabic language. So, and you find a lot of times, this is the interesting thing, that when you see an argument, you'll find the, that they use one ayah from the Quran from, for example, Abdullah Yusuf Ali translation. And then they use another one from another translation of the Quran, like Muhsin Khan. And then another ayah in the same article, in the same argument, they'll use it from, for example, another translator. Okay? You know, like Sahih International. This shows right away that they're selective in the translation. Why? See, because a word in Arabic has certain meanings. And depending how the translator translated it. And believe it or not, that's why we never say that the English version or the Hindi version or the whatever other language version, French version of the Quran, we don't say it's Quran. It says translation of the meaning of the Quran. And 
of course, this is the choice of the translator as to what words they might have picked. And a lot of times, brothers and sisters, a lot of words, and we have instances and proofs that things have been translated wrong. And that's why you cannot build an argument from an English translation or from any other language translation. It has to go back to the Arabic language. But again, as we said, many phrases, many words might have different meanings and also in different contexts. So one has to be very careful with that. Another one, not understanding the environment and culture of the 7th AC Arabia. So the year, the seventh year of the Arabia, which, which is the time of the Prophet ﷺ when the Quran was, was actually revealed. The culture of the Prophet ﷺ and the Arabs of that time, especially when it comes to the life. Okay? So a lot of people will attack Islam because they have no regards for the culture at that time. They think that the measuring stick is 21st century Californian culture, you know, or something, American culture, or British culture. That because of that, you are allowed to judge what happened at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the Arabian uh, culture, and so on. It's an unfair deal. And it's usually Islam that takes the short end of the stick. Why? If we look at any other culture, okay, we study ancient cultures, be it the Mayans, be it Indian cultures, be it native cultures, we always find and we call them as civilizations, okay? We take pride, we want to study them from an historical perspective, from a you know, social perspective, be it that some of the things that they've done are not in line with what the 21st century standards of morals are, but we respect them and we learn from them and we value them as civilizations and cultures. Like for example, the Mayans used to have human sacrifices. Yet you don't find people, and today remnants of the Mayans and the people are still there in South America. However, you don't find shows and TV, oh, look at these people, what they believe, and human sacrifice and putting them down. Of course, no one agrees to that. But you see the unfair treatment and judgment of Islam as opposed to all the other so-called, you know, civilizations, right? These civilizations become topics for National Geographic shows and documentaries, while Islam becomes topic for your 12 o'clock or 2 o'clock news of accusations and so on. Social media, books, missionaries, you name it, satellite TV shows, people talking and talking and picking on some of the cultural issues that were quite acceptable in the time of Arabia. And at the same time, that doesn't mean that because the culture was at that time, somehow, you know, it gives us the uh, approval of that, uh, you know, we're done with it. No, no. Culture is to be respected. And here's a very important point here, brothers and sisters, that shows the strength of Islam. You see, as time changed, that's what pushed and pressured for a lot of religions to change, because culture was changing. And because of that, halal and haram was susceptible to changes. But you see, Islam doesn't apologize and say, oh, you know, this was the culture of the, uh, you know, of Arabia at that time. No. No, that's not correct. You know, the 7th century Arabia. No. Culture, yes, is important, but a lot of things transcend the culture. And at the same time, the culture of the Prophet ﷺ was part and parcel of, of Islam. Now, there's certain things, of course, that, you know, are not necessarily mandatory or anything like that. But... We cannot allow for this argument to open the doors of people invalidating practices that the Prophet used to have just because of, you know, well, now we're in the 21st century. Issues of polygamy, which we'll discuss, for example. You know, we can't say, well, you know, there was a culture. Yeah, a lot of people don't understand it, and they blame it because they say, oh, how come, how come, how come? Well, with all due respect, Christianity had the same thing. We find Prophet Solomon having so many wives. We find many of the early Christians having so many wives. And we find that this was a practice that was acceptable and practiced throughout many, many different cultures and religions. But you see, Islam, again, is under the scope. Oh, Islam, Islam, you guys are all about the, you know, gratification of the uh, desires and so on. No, it's not nothing to do with that. It's your interpretation of that. 
See, people try to force their interpretation of that. You have to understand, number one, as you said, the culture and the position, and at the same time, the practice. And just because you've dealt away with it and you've invalidated it, doesn't mean that everyone has to do that. Right? Muslims are very adamant about maintaining the sunnah of the Prophet and we don't divorce the culture from the faith. A lot of the things in the culture of a Muslim are part and parcel with the faith. So this has to be understood. Another point, ignoring the fact that it's the Arabic text of the Quran and a hadith that matter, not the translation. Okay, we have to make very sure that we understand that we go back to the Arabic as we have previously said. Okay, it's not the translation and not the commentaries, okay? A lot of the times, that, oh, you find that they use a certain tafsir because, again, it matches the argument. But again, that's, we're not undermining tafsir, we're not undermining the commentaries, but we're saying that they're being selective. They pick what fits them, and that's not correct. Islam is clear, the Quran is clear, the hadith of the Prophet are clear, the sunnah is clear. Of course, there are certain matters that require elaboration from the scholars and so on. This is part and parcel of our faith. But not from these people, you have to understand. And not from these selective people that they say, oh, look what uh, this scholar said, so and so. Yeah, but what about the other 10 who said something on the same subject, right? Why are you picking this one? Ah, see, because it fits your argument. Because you can build this piece of the puzzle from here, with this weak hadith here, with this mistranslation here, with this lack of resource here, and put them all together and make your argument and confuse someone. It's not correct. This is deceptive, this is a lie, and we cannot accept that. Next, overlooking the fact that when it comes to explanations and commentaries, no single scholar is absolute authority on Islam. Okay? The opinion of a scholar, however learned they are, may be rejected or ignored for valid reasons. And the scholars of Islam made that very clear. If there is something more authentic, if there is a correct argument that is more correct from another scholar, as the Imam said, my sunnah or my way is the way of the Prophet If you find something that contradicts it, throw it against the wall. But you see these people come and take, ah, Imam so-and-so said this, Imam. But then you, when you study the subject, you find that maybe that was not the full picture or it was missing something with all due respect and the love and we're not even worthy of polishing their shoes and we acknowledge that but the truth is more beloved to us than a person or a character or a personality and this is something very important don't ever let anyone come and say but yeah but so and so said that and don't you uh, you know Keep them as they're the best thing, right? And, and the person says, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, how can I, you know, doubt, you know, what a companion said? No. Some of the Sahaba might have said something, but some other ones, you know, they deferred. So you have to understand, it's not about this person, that person. It's about what is the truth. And every single person in this world has a responsibility to know the truth and to try at least to exert the effort to know the truth. And especially... When it comes to things like this, that you are being attacked, that you should verify, you should ask, and you should try to find the truth. Let us move on now to, very important, counter techniques. So we found out some of the techniques that these people try to use to attack. Now what are some of the counter techniques that we can apply? Number one, the most important, know your safety zone and always fall back on it spiritually, psychologically, and rationally. So you might not have knowledge of everything in Islam, but you should have knowledge of something that gives you full and firm belief that you are on the truth. For example, the Quran is the word of Allah. Okay? This is your safety net. You know the miracles of it, you know the proofs of it, the scientific miracles, and you have firm belief that this is the correct way. Now, someone will come and bring, for example, a hadith or something from the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ and try to confuse you. And you're confused. You don't know how to answer it. You don't have the knowledge to answer it. You don't have the ability to answer it or not. Then, you stop and you say, wait a second. You might feel a doubt in your heart. Subhanallah al-Azim. That the shaitan is waiting for these things to put in your heart. Just anything that you might not know. And I remember, subhanallah, this story of a brother that became Muslim. 
And we went to discuss with some different faith people, and they were presenting something. And he had a question. And the presenter, he thought that he has a good question, this brother. And the presenter was able to respond to him and flip the tables on him. Okay, flip the tables on him. So this person was shocked. How come he responded to my question? What should I do? See, he didn't have anything to fall back. And I remember, bro, relax. I said, this is just a small issue that he was able to answer to. It's not a big deal. You know Islam, this is the, the, you know, it's just one little thing that you're confused over. This was the beginning of a slippery slope for this person who became a kafir after. And it started from there. I remember it very well. See, you need to have something to hold on, to be strong on. And this is for me, this is my advice. Know the Quran is the word of Allah. Even if you're confused, you fall back on that. Look, I don't know right now, but I am sure there's an uh, explanation. But what I know for sure in my safety zone, this is Islam is the truth. The Tawheed is the truth. The Quran is the word of Allah. And I have no doubt about it. Alhamdulillah, we've reached the end of this episode. I've just started one of the general counter techniques. I hope that you will continue following up with us, inshallah, next episode, where we'll continue these counter techniques. There's quite a few more. Make sure you stay tuned. This is your host, Gabriel Romani, and this course is Defense Against Disaster. We'll see you next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.